thanks both. Uh, it's very nice to be here, and thanks for uh, organizing this uh, lovely conference and in this beautiful place. Um, my topic today is peer-to-peer -to -peer markets. In 1995, eBay famously got started when Pierre Omidyar auctioned off a broken laser pointer and sold it for $14.83. What's delightful about that story, apart from the fact that it was a broken laser pointer, is that it shows how the internet made it so much easier for buyers and sellers who were located at different dispersed places and might not have known of each other's existence to find each other and reach uh, productive exchanges. Okay, and since that happened, and eBay, of course, was one of the first peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, uh, there have been, you know, as uh, John already mentioned, uh, 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 quite a, a huge explosion of these types of peer-to-peer uh, -peer businesses, starting with different kinds of marketplace businesses like eBay or Etsy for crafts or StubHub or consumer finance platforms like Prosper or Lending Club, online labor markets like Elance or Odesk. Uh, and now, you know, more recently, uh, companies like, like Uber and other on-demand services that are using mobile technology as well as just the internet to, to deliver uh, a peer-to-peer -peer type of uh, uh, business services. Okay. And in some sense, of course, these businesses take different forms. You have uh, some like eBay or Airbnb, which are decentralized marketplaces, and others like uh, Uber that have a more centralized uh, business model. Uh, but in some sense, they share a, a, a common core set of features. They, they use technology to uh, facilitate what are essentially spot markets for buyers and sellers. They allow small, flexible uh, suppliers to compete with larger ones, so hence peer-to-peer. They often facilitate trade in uh, personalized or time-varying goods or services, niche, sometimes niche goods or services. And then, and especially Germain, I guess, for, for, for this conference, they, they sometimes reduce costs by, by bypassing traditional uh, regulation. And partly for the, that last reason, many of them have also come under a lot of scrutiny recently. And part of that stems from antitrust concerns, part of that stems from concerns about consumer protection, and part of it stems from the disruption that they're causing to traditional industries and, and in some cases, to traditional uh, employment relationships. Okay, so I thought what I would try to do in, in this talk is to say a little bit about the economic research on peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, businesses and how one might think about their, uh, their impact uh, and uh, different regulatory approaches. And I thought to do that, I would split the the talk into three parts. I would start by saying a little bit about sort of how they do it, the, the, the market design of peer-to-peer of -peer, uh, platforms. And then uh, second, say something about their uh, relationship to traditional industries and how to conceptualize the way these businesses differ from, from traditional uh, 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 production. And then uh, finally, uh, sort of using the ideas from the first two parts to say a little bit about regu regulation. Okay, so the, the topic that has uh, uh, attracted, I think, by far the most research attention from economists uh, is the design, the design part of internet markets. So thinking about how, how should we best create uh, large-scale, efficient, technology-mediated marketplaces. Okay, and, and actually I'm happy to say that you know, those of us who work in this area, and including some of our distinguished speakers like Susan Athey and Preston McAfee and, and Hal Varian, uh, after you know, 15 or 20 years of research, actually, we've, we've, we've actually reached a very clear answer about how companies should design large-scale technology-mediated marketplaces. And, and the answer is they should, they should hire an economist to do it for them. <laughs> uh, okay, actually, more seriously, uh, you can sort of think about this problem of designing large-scale marketplaces as being one of solving a couple of, of, of core uh, problems. Uh, so one of them is to attract buyers and sellers. This is a two-sided market, as, as uh, uh, was already mentioned. Uh, second, you have to think about how to match those buyers and sellers uh, together and establish terms of trade or prices at which they can trade. And then uh, you need to establish trust. You need to make the market safe for uh, buyers and sellers. And in some sense, any of those, any of those things could be a topic 
for its own talk or probably even its own conference, but I thought I would, I would just mention you know, two broad insights that I think come out of recent research in this area and that I think will be useful for thinking about kind of the general high-level economic issues. Okay, so the first has to do with the problem of matching buyers to sellers and establishing prices at which they can trade. Okay, so this, that actually turns out to be a problem where economic theory has a lot to say because there's a, you know, there's a huge body of work in economics on the, the topic of mechanism design, which is basically the problem of, of, of thinking about how to create efficient exchange between, between buyers and sellers. And what the theory emphasizes is that the, the key problem is one of information. That is that the, the relevant information about who should, be, who should trade with who, who should be matched with who, and at what prices is dispersed. And the, the problem of, of market design is to, is to uh, figure out a way to aggregate that information to enable efficient uh, trading. Okay. Now, in practice, of course, that, that informs a lot of the market designs that we, that we see, but, but there's also a practical problem, which is that which is actually not the most interesting problem in some sense from the perspective of economic theory because we have never figured out how to model it in any nice or interesting way, which is, which is just the mundane problem of transactions costs, that you, you need to keep markets simple and convenient, and, and that means minimizing the amount of, uh, of cognition and communication that you ask uh, people for. And, uh, and, and thinking about that, that, uh, that trade-off, that sort of basically what platforms have to do or marketplaces have to do is to solve sort of a trade-off between efficiently collecting and using information and keeping things simple and convenient is, a, is sort of a good way to understand why lots of businesses that actually seem sort of different are in fact just solving the same problem in somewhat different ways. So I'll just give you an example. You think about a business like Airbnb Airbnb is a marketplace. You go out and you choose among you know, many, many apartments that are perhaps offered in, in Rome. In some sense, it seems quite different than Uber, where you open up their app and you just say where you're going and they send you a driver. But in some sense, they're solving the same problem. They have a decentralized, dis disparate set of suppliers. And on, in the one Airbnb case, they're asking, they're collecting more information from you. They're letting you pick exactly which apartment you want giving up some convenience because it's sort of a pain to search through all those apartments. And in the other case, Uber, they're just treating all the drivers as the same. And, and they're picking the driver for you, which of course doesn't elicit your preferences over, you know, I'd like this driver or that driver, but it makes it very convenient. And similarly for the drivers, they let the drivers veto riders based on their reputation, but they don't let them veto their destination. So they keep things, again, sort of simple and convenient, but they don't elicit all the information about drivers who might only like to do airport runs versus short runs around the city and, and so forth. Okay, so different, different ways of solving, in a sense, the same, the same problem. And you can see the same type of trade-off between convenience or transactions costs and efficient use of information in, in things like pricing mechanisms. So for example, in many marketplaces, eBay, Prosper for consumer loans, Odesk for services, they started with models that tried to bring in a lot of information, auction pricing models, and over time they move toward fixed or posted prices because they're just so convenient, even though they maybe don't aggregate information uh, as well. Okay, now one reason that perspective I think is kind of useful is that it also helps to see why platform data is so important, because it improves the trade-off. So if you think about, for example, a, a consumer lending platform like a lending club or a Prosper, taking information about people's risk characteristics and having a risk forecasting model that they use to set prices, or Google having a click-through model to generate a quality score that is used to generate advertising prices. One way to think about what they're doing is incorporating more information into the marketplace, but while keeping things equivalently simple and convenient for the participants in that market. The second market design problem that I wanted to, to mention has to do with trust. Okay, so trust is a is a is a is a is a big issue for almost all of the peer-to-peer -peer businesses that I'm aware of, and it's and particularly for some of the more newer, the more modern newer ones that are in some sense very intimate, like where you have people stay in your apartment or uh, uh, ride in your car, and. Uh, and you could imagine actually the trust problem making those sorts of businesses basically uh, infeasible. 
if you thought about how you would solve the problem of uh, making that kind of service uh, safe for the buyers and sellers, you, you could imagine that there would be two approaches. So one approach would be uh, an ex-ante approach where you carefully screened all of the participants in the market to make sure that they were trustworthy and that they weren't going to create problems. Okay. The, the, the other would be an ex post approach where you let a million flowers bloom and then you uh, collect information to see if people are violating your expectations about how they should uh, behave by using a reputation or review uh, system. And in some sense, a priori, if you would ask people I, in you know, 20 years ago when the internet was starting, which of these approaches would be the uh, approach that would win out, that would make sense, I don't know that there would have been an obvious uh, answer. In fact, it, you, people were, I think many people, certainly many economists were probably surprised in 1995 when it turned out that you could actually send money across the United States and a week later the thing that you'd seen on the internet would show up more or less as you expected it. Nowadays, of course, we just take it for granted that that will happen. But um, that would not necessarily have been you know, a priori obvious, I think. And, and, and I think one interesting thing we can take from that actually has to do with, and this is going to come back in a minute when I talk about regulation, it has to do with this choice between ex ante and ex post systems. Because in fact, what most peer-to-peer, -peer, many peer-to-peer -peer businesses have done is they, they rely, they, they do do some light upfront screenings. So there is some ex ante assurance of, of trust and, and quality, but much of it is relying on ex post mechanisms. And I know there's going to be a session later on reputation mechanisms, and, I, and actually I, I will bet that one of the things you'll hear in that session is some discussion of all of the problems that those systems have, that, that there are incentives for fraud, that, that people don't have incentives to post reviews, or they have too much incentive to post reviews, or they have incentive to post good reviews for themselves and bad reviews for other people. And, all kinds of you know, problems. And of course, those problems do exist. But I think to first order, what is really striking is how well those mechanisms seem to work to the extent you know, that many people you know, are, are willing you know, these days just to hop in someone else's car or, or stay in their apartment or have them come over and clean out their garage based on an internet advertisement or even come over and take care of their uh, children uh, without worrying uh, all that much. Not everybody has random people off the internet take care of their children. Uh, okay, so, um, okay, so, so uh, one more thing about the market design uh, uh, piece that I think is interesting. So some of these market design choices that, that firms have made have, have become subject to regulatory and antitrust scrutiny. And, and I think, you know, I don't have much to say about that and it's gonna come up later in the conference, I bet, but, um, I think one thing that's interesting about that is, in some sense, it's tempting to view a lot of market design choices that platforms make as being strategic. That is, that, that they're attempting to foreclose rivals, that they're trying to unfairly take advantage of buyers and sellers. And I think one thing that's sort of useful to keep in mind is that that may be true in some cases, of course, but that in many cases, the sort of first order objective for platforms almost certainly has to be to make the market more efficient. And, from that perspective, you can see that some, some practices, market design practices or policies that have become subject to scrutiny or criticism do actually have good efficiency rationales. Let's give you two examples. So one is the, both involve Uber. So, so one is Uber's use of surge pricing, which is making prices high during periods of peak demand. That's come in for a lot of criticisms because people view it as unfair that uh, someone who really needs a ride at a time of peak demand has to pay more. It, it, it's not like it used to be in taxis. But of course, it has a very natural efficiency rationale, which is that by making prices high when there's a lot of demand, you better balance demand and supply in the market. Okay. Similar point goes to thinking about the two-sided reviews that companies like Uber and Airbnb use. If you read the newspapers, you often occasionally see people uh, upset about the idea that as consumers are being rated by the people selling things to them. They're not used to that. And um, it seems invasive. Uh, but at the same time, th there, there is a natural reason why you would want to do that as a platform, which is that there's a trust problem also for the people who have to drive you around or let you stay in their apartment. And this is there to help solve that, that trust problem. 
Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about market design, and I'm going to move to the second point, set of points I want to make, which are, have to do with the, the relationship between peer-to-peer -peer businesses and traditional industries. And I thought to do that, I would, um, at the risk of uh, um, scaring you off in the first talk of the day, I would introduce a very simple model, and I promise it will be a very simple model. So, um, but I, one I've sort of found useful, I think. So, uh, um, so, so here's a, here's a, a way to th here's the way I, one way you might think about what peer to peer businesses are doing in relation to traditional industries. So, so think about a world where there are two types of supply technologies. The, one way to su to be a, to, to supply uh, to be a, a producer is to build dedicated capacity, which involves an upfront cost to build the capacity, but then low uh, uh, costs once you have the capacity. So, you know, think a ho think about building a hotel. Okay. The other is that you could be a flexible supplier. You could uh, skip the upfront costs, and then you could produce uh, when your opportunity costs have, happen to be low. So think about me renting out my apartment on a weekend that I'm not uh, using it. Okay. Now, and that flexibility, by the way, seems to actually be quite an important part of, of, of recent modern you know, on-demand service businesses like, like Uber. Uh, that, that the suppliers seem to be, care a lot about the flexibility that the platform uh, offers them. They don't have to make a big, uh, a dedicated uh, investment. Okay, I want to add two more ingredients to this model to make it an interesting model. Or, and so one, now let's, let's add some demand. Let's imagine there's demand for this product that the suppliers are producing and that it's sometimes high and sometimes low, so it's time varying. Or, and, and let's also assume that for sellers to uh, become visible, to make themselves uh, known to buyers, they have to make some upfront investment. So think about it as an advertising or reputational uh, barrier to, to entry. Okay, this wrote it as F. Okay, okay. So now we could ask: in this type of world, what would you expect to be the market structure uh, of the uh, industry? So one way you could have, one market structure you could have, and this is what will happen. For example, if uh, there are scale economies in production. Uh, or very large costs of becoming visible, big reputational advertising barriers to entry, is that uh, you would expect this, the market to be dominated by dedicated sellers. They'll build capacity and then they, they sell, and when demand is low, uh, think hotel rooms in Rome in February, some of the capacity isn't utilized. When demand is high, so think hotel rooms in Rome right now, uh, all the capacities utilized and the prices are, are high. And, and what determines the, the, the amount of capacity that gets built is a, is a, is a, is a condition that, that, that says that profits have to be enough to reimburse the costs of investment. Okay. So another type of market structure you could have, and this is one that you might think would characterize industries that have just a very little bit of demand or maybe very sporadic demand, would be one where there's, the sellers are flexible. Okay. So they don't invest much up front because there's not much demand or it only comes once in a while. There's a, some sellers around who might be willing to, to sell if, if necessary, and that's going to be probably a market with not a lot of uh, trade. Okay, and then finally, you could imagine a world where there's both kinds of, uh, uh, of sellers, where there's dedicated sellers who build capacity and always serve the market, and then there's flexible sellers who serve the market at times of high demand uh, uh, and create some uh, supply elasticity. Okay, okay so I went into that model because now I want to think for a minute about how could we envision the entry, conceptualize the entry of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. So one way then you could think about peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces is that essentially what they do is they make investments in order to make sellers visible to buyers. So they basically create a mechanism to make many, many sellers I, 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 I enable many, many sellers to, to, be, to be seen and to trade with, with buyers. And, uh, and, and in a sense, what, what you might think then that would do, it's, it's in a sense quite, quite clear, is that they would, uh, th that investment would uh, enable flexible sellers who would you know, have the hardest time justifying a, a, a big investment in their own advertising. Uh, to, uh, to, to enter the market and trade with buyers. And um, it would uh, lower prices by expanding supply and therefore help consumers. It would be particularly valuable in situations where there were not large scale economies in production, 
in situations where there was variable demand or niche demand or specialized or personalized demand that wasn't well served by very large capacity uh, investments. Um, and, uh, and it would, um, and it would hinge, it, it's, uh, benefits would hinge a lot on how effective the intermediation was and how well the, the platform could succeed in, in making the, the, the small uh, sellers visible to the, to the buyers. Okay, and so, um, and actually, you could sort of use this framework actually to also to think about what you would expect in terms of the market structure of the platforms, because you know then what becomes a, what, what's sort of apparent for platforms is that what what would de what should determine the market structure of platforms is also scale economies, but it's scale economies and in intermediation. It's it's who can uh, efficiently whether being big helps you efficiently match uh, buyers and sellers. And, and of course, the, the market structure would, would, is going to be important because that might determine what kind of rents or what kind of profits the, the platforms can make. Um, oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. So. Um, okay. And so, 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 what then? Do, do how then could we think about the entry of you know the the, the effects of of peer to peer uh, platforms in this framework? Well, we could we could think about them creating. Benefits, creating more possibilities for trade uh, by helping buyers and sellers to find each other, by lowering the investment required for sellers to to uh, to get into the market and find buyers, by promoting entry and competition, and by better serving markets with with time varying and and niche demand. Okay, the, there, there's also of course the the I should mention the effect on incumbents, and in a setting like this, of course, the entry of of smaller suppliers may not be so so good for for incumbents, as we you know see uh, uh, these days. This is a protest of Uber by the London cab drivers. Okay, so um, okay, so now let me finally finish by making a couple points about regulation. So there's been a lot of discussion recently about the regulation of peer-to-peer -peer businesses, and actually, as I was writing these slides. Uh, I kept finding more and more newspaper clippings uh, about different cities that were regulating you know, short-term accommodation or regulating uh, uh, ride-sharing or uh, financial regulators who were thinking about peer-to-peer -peer lending or uh, last week there was a case in California where uh, uh, the Labor Relations Board ruled that uh, one of the Uber drivers was an employee as opposed to a contractor which in principle would have make Uber subject to employment law and regulation. Uh, rather than uh, being uh, more lightly uh, uh, regulated. Um, and there are some important regulatory issues, I think partly because um, some of the industries that peer-to-peer -peer businesses are now entering are ones that are fairly heavily regulated. So you know, it's quite hard to get a hotel zoned, but uh, Airbnb makes it pretty easy to open a small hotel, and it's hard to get a taxi license, but Uber lets pretty much anyone run a taxi service. Um, and and, and these, these platforms also seem to have lower burdens for health and safety and occupational regulation. They have some tax advantages because they don't always, uh, uh, aren't always collecting the same taxes that their traditional competitors are. Uh, if you ask economists, as the Chicago Booth School did uh, last fall, uh, many of them seem to feel that regulators ought to adopt a very light touch with, with regulation. And, I think to think about why, um, it, actually, it helps to sort of think about the, the why we have many of the regulations that these companies are running uh, afoul of. And when you do that, there's, you can see there's, there's a couple, you know, the, the regulations have several different purposes, really. So one of the big justifications for many regulations is consumer protection, which, have, you know, it, it's important. And actually, I, I, I was going to replace, after Alex de Cornier and I had a ride from the uh, airport yesterday with a guy who was driving about 80 miles an hour while texting, um, I was thinking about switching this slide, but I like this picture of the shower, so I kept it. Uh, I, OK, so, so what are the regulations that are, that, that are sort of motivated by consumer protection? There are things like licensing requirements, health and safety regulations, state usury laws, pricing restrictions on, on interest rates or, or taxi uh, fares. And the, the you know, traditional economic view of these regulations is basically that 
they ought to be subject to cost-benefit analysis, that they create costs for consumers by limiting entry and competition, but, um, but they might have benefits as well. And they might, uh, they might protect uh, consumers from, from unscrupulous sellers. They might protect consumers from themselves. Uh, they might protect complete market breakdowns. Okay. And there's a couple of reasons, however, that you might think that new peer-to-peer -peer businesses are somewhat different, or at least have a somewhat different cost-benefit calculus. And uh, let's mention two. Okay, so one of them has to do with this idea of sort of ex ante versus uh, ex post uh, enforcement uh, of, of, of behavior. The, the traditional approach to, to consumer protection regulation often relies a lot on ex ante regulation. That is, it, it's, uh, uh, and it imposes fairly high upfront costs, like uh, getting uh, licensed to uh, enter an industry. Whereas the peer-to-peer -peer model is premised almost entirely, and all its benefits, as I sort of was trying to argue in that little model, come about from lowering those upfront costs. And so imposing, you know, it's not clear that you would necessarily want to impose regulations that, that sort of go completely against the grain of the business model that's creating uh, 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 benefits for consumers. The second is that uh, there's a sense in which, and this goes to the market design problem, that peer-to-peer -peer platforms have uh, already a fairly strong incentive to self-regulate. Maybe not an efficient one or perfectly optimal one, but they do have a significant uh, incentive to self-regulate because if, if they can't make the market, if, if, if the informational conditions in a market were such that the, no trade was occurring, they wouldn't be a very successful uh, business. They need to have enough trust in the market to make it work, and that means having enough quality in the market to, to make the service, the service work. And, and, and I think you know, one thing that sort of links those things also together is that it has to do with the, the change in the technology, that the modern data environment changes the sort of benefit cost analysis of regulation. And I, to my mind, it sort of shifts it much more toward an, toward an ex post view of how we ought to do uh, regulation as opposed to an ex ante uh, uh, licensing uh, type of, type of uh, approach. Okay, I'll just finish with, the, with, with one more uh, point. That was my last slide. Um, the, some of the regulations that, uh, that are now being debated about peer-to-peer -peer markets um, are not, in fact, about consumer protection. They're, they're also about protection, but they're about protection of other uh, groups. So, for example, if you think about zoning restrictions in uh, cities, you know, by and large, those, those exist to preserve uh, neighborhoods. If you think about uh, employment laws, those very often exist to protect uh, uh, workers, not consumers. If you think about uh, 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 licensing requirements, to, at least in some cases, for example, in taxis, George Sigler famously argued that they exist to protect taxi drivers. Okay, so, there's a, actually, in some sense, it's much harder to say something interesting economically about these types of regulations because they're fundamentally redistributive. And so, you know, to the extent that you're just trading off the interests of one group, say, uh, workers or uh, uh, incumbent producers or uh, 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 residents against the interests of another group, say, consumers, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to say, to say much against that there are probably going to be winners and losers from any uh, regulatory uh, choice. But I think nonetheless it's possible to say something, which is that um, one is that, at least to my mind, the, ben the, the competitive benefits of peer-to-peer -peer entry for consumers do seem to be, in many cases, very large. And it, I think it makes you, you know, leery that we ought to, you know, about regulating them, in a sense, out of existence before they had a chance to see how big the costs uh, are. Okay, and one way to think about that is that you know, it's just sort of from static cost-benefit analysis. The benefits seem big, the costs maybe aren't so big. But the other way to think about it is that, in a sense, we, we don't quite know what the costs and benefits will, will be. And so, uh, so if you were thinking about how to, how to do regulation, one thing you might want to take into account is that we, we, by sort of letting things go for a while, we might actually learn something that would enable us to make better decisions uh, 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 later. And, um, 
I think, for example, the, the case that came up in California last week about employment law, to my mind, that sort of would be a good example. In that case, they, they ruled that an Uber driver was an employee. And, you know, I guess the law could, in some sense, be read, interpreted either way, have them, first people be employees or uh, uh, be uh, uh, contractors. But, uh, of course, to, to make uh, that their business model is really premised, at least at the moment, around flexibility. Now, it may turn out that down the line, their business isn't premised on flexibility. It may turn out that it's actually better to have full-time drivers or full-time workers. And maybe for on-demand services, it will turn out that it's actually better to have traditional work arrangements. But in some sense, we haven't had enough experience for them even to figure that out. So to sort of have you know, a regulatory approach that prejudges that seems to be, uh, in some sense, not the, not the, probably not the, the right way to go, and that you ought to you ought to do some learning before we make uh, too many irreversible uh, uh, decisions. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and turn it over.